Chapter twenty three. I corroborate Mr. Dick and choose a profession. When I awoke in the morning, I thought very much of little Emily and her emotion last night after Martha had left. I felt as if I had come into the knowledge of those domestic weaknesses and tendernesses in a sacred confidence, and that to disclose them, even to steer forth, would be wrong. I had no gentler feeling towards any one than towards the pretty creature who had been my playmate, and whom I have always been persuaded, and shall always be persuaded, to my dying day, I then devotedly loved. The repetition to any ears, even to Steerforth's, of what she had been unable to repress when her heart lay open to me by an accident, I felt would be a rough deed unworthy of myself, unworthy of the light of our pure childhood, which I always saw encircling her head. I made a resolution, therefore, to keep it in my own breast, and there it gave her image a new grace. While we were at breakfast a letter was delivered to me from my aunt. As it contained matter on which I thought Steerforth could advise me as well as any one, and on which I knew I should be delighted to consult him, I resolved to make it a subject of discussion on our journey home. For the present we had enough to do in taking leave of all our friends. Mr. Barkers was far from being the last among them in his regret at our departure, and I believe would even have opened the box again and sacrificed another guinea if it would have kept us eight and forty hours in Yarmouth. Peggotty and all her family were full of grief at our going. The whole house of Omer and Yoram turned out to bid us good-bye, and there were so many seafaring volunteers in attendance on Steerforth when our portmanteau went to the coach, that if we had had the baggage of a regiment with us we should hardly have wanted porters to carry it. In a word we departed to the regret and admiration of all concerned, and left a great many people very sorry behind us. "'Do you stay long here, Littimer?' I said, as he stood waiting to see the coach start. "'No, sir,' he replied. Uh, "'Probably not very long, sir.' "'He can hardly say just now,' observed Steerforth carelessly. "'He knows what he has to do, and he'll do it.' "'That I am sure he will,' I said. Littimer touched his hat in acknowledgment of my good opinion, and I felt about eight years old. He touched it once more, wishing us a good journey, and we left him standing on the pavement, as respectable a mystery as any pyramid in Egypt. For some little time we held no conversation, Steerforth being unusually silent, and I being sufficiently engaged in wondering within myself when I should see the old places again, and what new changes might happen to me or them in the meanwhile. At length Steerforth, becoming gay and talkative in a moment, as he could become anything he liked at any moment, pulled me by the arm. "'Find a voice, David. What about that letter you were speaking of at breakfast?' "'Oh,' said I, taking it out of my pocket, "'it's from my aunt.' "'And what does she say, requiring consideration?' "'Why, she reminds me, Steerforth,' said I, "'that I came out on this expedition to look about me and to think a little.' "'Which, of course, you have done. "'Indeed, I can't say I have particularly. "'To tell the truth, I am afraid I have forgotten it.' "'Well, look about you now, and make up for your negligence,' said Steerforth. "'Look to the right, and you'll see a flat country, with a good deal of marsh in it. "'Look to the left, and you'll see the same. "'Look to the front, and you'll find no difference. "'Look to the rear, and there it is still.' I laughed, and replied that I saw no suitable profession in the whole prospect, which was perhaps to be attributed to its flatness.' "'What says your aunt on the subject?' inquired Steerforth, glancing at the letter in my hand. "'Does she suggest anything?' "'Why, yes,' I said. "'She asks me here if I think I should like to be a proctor. What do you think of it?' "'Well, I don't know,' replied Steerforth coolly. "'You may as well do that as anything else, I suppose.' I could not help laughing again at his balancing all callings and professions so equally, and I told him so. "'What is a proctor, Steerforth?' said I. "'Why, he's a sort of monkish attorney,' replied Steerforth. "'He is, to some faded courts held in Doctor's Commons, the lazy old nook near St. Paul's churchyard, what solicitors are to the courts of law and equity. He is a functionary whose existence, in the natural course of things, would have terminated about two hundred years ago. I can tell you best what he is by telling you what Doctor's Commons is. It's a little out-of-the-way place where they administer what is called ecclesiastical law.' and play all kinds of tricks with obsolete old monsters of Acts of Parliament, which three-fourths of the world know nothing about, and the other fourth supposes to have been dug up in a fossil state in the days of the Edwards. 
It is a place that has an ancient monopoly in suits about people's wills and people's marriages and disputes among ships and boats. Nonsense, dear Forth, I exclaimed. You don't mean to say that there is an affinity between nautical matters and ecclesiastical matters? I don't indeed, my dear boy, he returned. But I mean to say that they are managed and decided by the same set of people down in that same doctor's commons. You shall go there one day, and find them blundering through half the nautical terms in Young's Dictionary, apropos of the Nancy having run down the Sarah Jane, or Mr. Peggotty and the Armouth boatmen having put off in a gale of wind with an anchor and cable to the Nelson India man in distress, and you shall go there another day and find them deep in the evidence, pro and con, respecting a clergyman who has misbehaved himself, and you shall find the judge in the nautical case, the advocate in the clergyman's case, or contrariwise. They are like actors. Now a man's a judge, and now he is not a judge. Now he is one thing, now he is another, now he is something else. Change and change about. But it's always a very pleasant, profitable little affair of private theatricals, presented to an uncommonly select audience. But advocates and proctors are not the same thing, said I, a little puzzled. Are they? No, returned Steerforth, the advocates are civilians, men who have taken a doctor's degree at college, which is the first reason of my knowing anything about it. The proctors employ the advocates. Both get very comfortable fees, and altogether they make a mighty snug little party. On the whole, I would recommend you to take to doctor's commons kindly, David. They plume themselves on their gentility there, I can tell you, if that's any satisfaction. I made allowance for Steerforth's light way of treating the subject, and considering it with reference to the staid air of gravity and antiquity which I associated with that lazy old nook near St. Paul's churchyard, did not feel indisposed towards my aunt's suggestion, which she left to my free decision, making no scruple of telling me it had occurred to her on her lately visiting her own proctor in Doctor's Commons for the purpose of settling her will in my favour. "'That's a laudable proceeding on the part of your aunt at all events.' said Steerforth when I mentioned it, and one deserving all encouragement. Daisy, my advice is that you take kindly to Doctor's Commons. I quite made up my mind to do so. I then told Steerforth that my aunt was in town awaiting me, as I found from her letter, and that she had taken lodgings for a week at a kind of private hotel at Lincoln's Inn Fields, where there was a stone staircase and a convenient door in the roof, my aunt being firmly persuaded that every house in London was going to be burnt down every night. We achieved the rest of our journey pleasantly, sometimes recurring to Doctor's Commons, and anticipating the distant days when I should be a proctor there, which Steerforth pictured in a variety of humorous and whimsical lights that made us both merry. When we came to our journey's end, he went home, engaging to call upon me the next day but one, and I drove to Lincoln's Inn Fields, where I found my aunt up and waiting supper. If I had been round the world since we parted, we could hardly have been better pleased to meet again. My aunt cried outright as she embraced me, and said, pretending to laugh, that if my poor mother had been alive, that silly little creature would have shed tears, she had no doubt. "'So you have left Mr. Dick behind, aunt,' said I. "'I am sorry for that. Ah, Janet, how do you do?' As Janet curtsied, hoping I was well, I observed my aunt's visage lengthen very much. "'I am sorry for it, too,' said my aunt, rubbing her nose. "'I have had no peace of mind, Trot, since I have been here. "'Before I could ask why, she told me. "'I am convinced,' said my aunt, laying her hand with melancholy firmness on the table, "'that Dick's character is not a character to keep the donkeys off. "'I am confident he wants strength of purpose. "'I ought to have left Janet at home instead, and then my mind might perhaps have been at ease. "'If ever there was a donkey trespassing on my green—' said my aunt with emphasis. There was one this afternoon at four o'clock. A cold feeling came over me from head to foot, and I know it was a donkey. I tried to comfort her on this point, but she rejected consolation. It was a donkey, said my aunt, and it was the one with the stumpy tail which that murdering sister of a woman rode when she came to my house. This has been ever since the only name my aunt knew for Miss Murdstone. If there is any donkey in Dover whose audacity is harder to me to bear than another's, that, said my aunt, striking the table, is the animal. Janet ventured to suggest that my aunt might be disturbing herself unnecessarily, and that she believed the donkey in question was then engaged in the sand and gravel line of business, and was not available for the purposes of trespass. But my aunt wouldn't hear of it. 
Supper was comfortably served and hot, though my aunt's rooms were very high up, whether that she might have more stone stairs for her money, or might be nearer to the door and the roof, I don't know, and consisted of roast fowl, a steak, some vegetables, to all of which I did ample justice, and which were all excellent. But my aunt had her own ideas concerning London provisions, and ate but little. "'I suppose this unfortunate fowl was born and brought up in a cellar.' said my aunt, and never took the air except on a hackney coach stand. I hope the steak may be beef, but I don't believe it. Nothing's genuine in the place, in my opinion, but the dirt. Don't you think the fowl may have come out of the country, aunt? I hinted. Certainly not, returned my aunt. It would be no pleasure to a London tradesman to sell anything that was what he pretended it was. I did not venture to controvert this opinion, but I made a good supper, which had greatly satisfied her to see me do. When the table was cleared, Janet assisted her to arrange her hair, to put on her nightcap, which was of a smarter construction than usual, in case of fire, my aunt said, and to fold her gown back over her knees, these being her usual preparations for warming herself before going to bed. I then made her, according to certain established regulations, from which no deviation, however slight, could ever be permitted, a glass of hot wine and water, and a slice of toast cut into long, thin strips. With these accompaniments we were left alone to finish the evening, my aunt sitting opposite to me, drinking her wine and water, soaking her strips of toast in it one by one before eating them, and looking benignantly on me from among the borders of her nightcap. "'Well, Trot,' she began, "'what do you think of the Proctor plan, or have you not begun to think about it yet?' "'I have thought a good deal about it, my dear aunt, and I have talked a good deal about it with Steerforth. I like it very much indeed. I like it exceedingly.' come said my aunt that's cheering i have only one difficulty aunt say what it is trot she returned why i want to ask aunt as it seems from what i understand to be a limited profession whether my entrance into it would not be very expensive it will cost returned my aunt to article you just a thousand pounds now my dear aunt said i drawing my chair nearer i am uneasy in my mind about that it is a large sum of money you have expended a great deal on my education, and have always been as liberal to me in all things as it was possible to be. You have been the soul of generosity. Surely there are some ways in which I might begin life with hardly any outlay, and yet begin with a good hope of getting on by resolution and exertion. Are you sure that it would not be better to try that course? Are you certain that you can afford to part with so much money, and that it is right that it should be so expended? I only ask you, my second mother, to consider. Are you certain? My aunt finished eating the piece of toast on which she was then engaged, looking me full in the face all the while, and then, setting her glass on the chimney-piece and folding her hands upon her folded skirts, replied as follows. "'Trot, my child, if I have any object in life, it is to provide for your being a good, a sensible, and a happy man. I am bent upon it, and so is Dick. I should like some people that I know to hear Dick's conversation on the subject. Its sagacity is wonderful, but no one knows the resources of that man's intellect except myself." She stopped for a moment to take my hand between hers, and went on. It is in vain, Trot, to recall the past, unless it works some influence upon the present. Perhaps I might have been better friends with your poor father. Perhaps I might have been better friends with that poor child, your mother, even after your sister Betsy Trotwood disappointed me. When you came to me, a little runaway boy, all dusty and wayworn, perhaps I thought so. From that time until now, Trot, you have ever been a credit to me, and a pride and a pleasure. I have no other claim upon my means, at least—here to my surprise she hesitated, and was confused. Uh, no, I have no other claim upon my means. You are my adopted child. Only be a loving child to me in my old age, and bear with my whims and fancies, and you will do more for an old woman whose prime of life was not so happy or conciliating as it might have been, than ever that old woman did for you." It was the first time I had heard my aunt refer to her past history. There was a magnanimity in her quiet way of doing so, and of dismissing it, which would have exalted her in my respect and affection, if anything could. "'All is agreed and understood between us now, Trot said my aunt, and we need talk of this no more. Give me a kiss, and we'll go to the commons after breakfast to-morrow. We had a long chat by the fire before we went to bed. I slept in a room on the same floor with my aunt's, and was a little disturbed in the course of the night by her knocking at my door as often as she was agitated by a distant sound of hackney-coaches or market-carts, and inquiring if I heard the engines. 
but towards the morning she slept better and suffered me to do so too about midday we set off for the offices of messrs spendlow and jorkins in doctors commons my aunt who had this other general opinion in reference to london that every man she saw was a pickpocket gave me her purse to carry for her which had ten guineas in it and some silver we made a pause at the toy shop in fleet street to see the giants of st dunstan strike upon the bells we had timed our going so as to catch them at it at twelve o'clock and then went on towards ludgate hill and st paul's churchyard we were crossing to the former place when I found that my aunt greatly accelerated her speed, and looked frightened. I observed at the same time that a lowering, ill-dressed man who had stopped and stared at us in passing, a little before, was coming so close after us as to brush against her. "'Trot, my dear Trot,' cried my aunt in a terrified whisper, and pressing my arm, "'I don't know what I am to do.' "'Don't be alarmed,' said I. "'There's nothing to be afraid of. Step into a shop, and I'll soon get rid of this fellow.' no no child she returned don't speak to him for the world i entreat you i order you good heaven aunt said i he's nothing but a sturdy beggar you don't know what he is replied my aunt you don't know who he is you don't know what you say we had stopped in an empty doorway while this was passing and he had stopped too don't look at him said my aunt as i turned my head indignantly but get me a coach my dear and wait for me in st paul's churchyard wait for you i replied yes rejoined my aunt i must go alone i must go with him with him aunt this man i am in my senses she replied and i tell you i must get me a coach however much astonished i might be i was sensible that i had no right to refuse compliance with such a peremptory command i hurried away a few paces and called a hackney chariot which was passing empty almost before i could let the steps down my aunt sprang in i don't know how and the man followed she waved her hand to me to go away so earnestly that all confounded as i was i turned from them at once in doing so i heard her say to the coachman drive anywhere drive straight on and presently the chariot passed me going up the hill what mr dick had told me and what i had supposed to be a delusion of his now came into my mind I could not doubt that this person was the person of whom he had made such mysterious mention, though what the nature of his hold upon my aunt could possibly be I was quite unable to imagine. After half an hour's cooling in the churchyard I saw the chariot coming back. The driver stopped beside me, and my aunt was sitting in it alone. She had not yet sufficiently recovered from her agitation to be quite prepared for the visit we had to make. She desired me to get into the chariot and to tell the coachman to drive slowly up and down a little while. She said no more except, My dear child, never ask me what it was, and don't refer to it. Until she had perfectly regained her composure when she told me that she was quite herself now, and we might get out. On giving me her purse to pay the driver, I found that all the guineas were gone, and only the loose silver remained. Doctor's Commons was approached by a little low archway. Before we had taken many paces down the street beyond it, the noise of the city seemed to melt as if by magic into a softened distance. A few dull courts and narrow ways brought us to the sky-lighted offices of Spendlow and Jorkins, in the vestibule of which temple, accessible to pilgrims without the ceremony of knocking, three or four clerks were at work as copyists. One of these, a little dry man, sitting by himself, who wore a stiff brown wig that looked as if it were made of gingerbread, rose to receive my aunt and show us into Mr. Spendlow's room. "'Mr. Spendlow's in coat, ma'am,' said the dry man. "'It's the arches day, but it's close by, and I'll send for him directly.' As we were left to look about us while Mr. Spendlow was fetched, I availed myself of the opportunity. The furniture of the room was old-fashioned and dusty, and the green baize on the top of the writing-table had lost all its colour and was as withered and pale as an old pauper. There were a great many bundles of papers on it, some endorsed as allegations, and some, to my surprise, as libels, and some as being in the consistory court, and some in the arches court, and some in the prerogative court, and some in the admiralty court, and some in the delegates court, giving me occasion to wonder much how many courts there might be in the gross, and how long it would take to understand them all. Besides these, there were sundry immense manuscript books of evidence taken on affidavit, strongly bound and tied together in massive sets, set to each cause, as if every cause were a history in ten or twelve volumes. 
all this looked tolerably expensive i thought and gave me an agreeable notion of a proctor's business i was casting my eyes with increasing complacency over these and many similar objects when hasty footsteps were heard in the room outside and mr spenlow in a black gown trimmed with white fur came hurrying in taking off his hat as he came he was a little light-haired man with undeniable boots and the stiffest of white cravats and shirt collars he was buttoned up mighty trim and tight and must have taken a great deal of pains with his whiskers which were accurately curled his gold watch-chain was so massive that a fancy came across me that he ought to have a sinewy golden arm to draw it out with, like those which are put up over the gold-beater's shops. He was got up with such care and was so stiff that he could hardly bend himself, being obliged, when he glanced at some papers on his desk after sitting down in his chair, to move his whole body from the bottom of his spine like punch. I had previously been presented by my aunt, and had been courteously received. He now said— and so mr copperfield you think of entering into our profession i casually mentioned to miss trotwood when i had the pleasure of an interview with her the other day with another inclination of his body punch again uh, that there was a vacancy here uh, miss trotwood was good enough to mention that she had a nephew who was her peculiar care and for whom she was seeking to provide genteely in life uh, that nephew i believe i now have the pleasure of punch again I bowed my acknowledgments, and said that my aunt had mentioned to me that there was that opening, and said that I believed I should like it very much, that I was strongly inclined to like it, and had taken immediately to the proposal, that I could not absolutely pledge myself to like it until I knew something more about it, and though it was little else than a matter of form, I presume I should have an opportunity of trying how I liked it before I bound myself to it irrevocably. No, oh, surely, surely, said Mr. Spenlow. We always, in this house, propose a month, an initiatory month. I should be happy myself to propose two months, three, an indefinite period, in fact. But I have a partner, Mr. Jorkins. And the premium, sir, I returned, is a thousand pounds. And the premium, stamp included, is a thousand pounds, said Mr. Spendlow. As I have mentioned to Miss Trotwood, I am actuated by no mercenary considerations. A few men are less so, I believe, but Mr. Jorkins has his opinions on these subjects, and I am bound to respect Mr. Jorkins's opinions. Mr. Jorkins thinks a thousand pounds too little, in short. I suppose, sir, said I, still desiring to spare my aunt, that it is not the custom here if an articled clerk were particularly useful and made himself a perfect master in his profession. I could not help blushing. This looked so like praising myself. I suppose it is not the custom, in the later years of his time, to allow him any— Mr. Spendlow, by great effort, just lifted his head far enough out of his cravat to shake it, and answered, anticipating the word, salary. Uh, no, I will not say what consideration I might give to that point myself, Mr. Copperfield, if I were unfettered. Uh, Mr. Jorkins is immovable. I was quite dismayed by the idea of this terrible Jorkins, but I found out afterwards that he was a mild man of a heavy temperament, whose place in the business was to keep himself in the background, and be constantly exhibited by name as the most obdurate and ruthless of men. If a clerk wanted his salary raised, Mr. Jorkins wouldn't listen to such a proposition. If a client were slow to settle his bill of costs, Mr. Jorkins was resolved to have it paid and however painful these things might be, and always were, to the feelings of Mr. Spendlow, Mr. Jorkins would have his bond. The heart and hand of the good angel Spendlow would have always been open, but for the restraining demon Jorkins. As I have grown older, I think I have had experience of some other houses doing business on the principle of Spendlow and Jorkins. It was settled that I should begin my month's probation as soon as I pleased and that my aunt need neither remain in town nor return at its expiration, as the articles of the agreement, of which I was to be the subject, could easily be sent to her at home for her signature. When we had got so far, Mr. Spendlow offered to take me into court then and there, and show me what sort of place it was. As I was willing enough to know, we went out with this object, leaving my aunt behind, who would trust herself, she said, in no such place, and who, I think, regarded all courts of law as a sort of powder-mills that might blow up at any time. 
Mr. Spendlow conducted me through a paved courtyard formed of grave brick houses, which I inferred from the doctor's names upon the doors to be the official abiding places of the learned advocates of whom Steerforth had told me, and into a large dull room, not unlike a chapel to my thinking, on the left hand. The upper part of this room was fenced off from the rest, and there, on the two sides of a raised platform of the horseshoe form, sitting on easy old-fashioned dining-room chairs, were sundry gentlemen in red gowns and grey wigs, whom I found to be the doctors aforesaid. Blinking over a little desk like a pulpit-desk in the curve of the horseshoe was an old gentleman, whom, if I had seen him in a knavery, I should certainly have taken for an owl, but who, I learned, was the presiding judge. In the space within the horseshoe, lower than these, that is to say, on about the level of the floor, were sundry other gentlemen, of Mr. Spendlow's rank, and dressed like him in black gowns with white fur upon them, sitting at a long green table. Their cravats were in general stiff, I thought, and their looks haughty. But in this last respect I presently conceived that I had done them an injustice, for when two or three of them had to rise to answer a question of the presiding dignitary, I never saw anything more sheepish. The public, represented by a boy with a comforter, and a shabby genteel man secretly eating crumbs out of his coat-pockets, was warming itself at a stove in the centre of the court. The languid stillness of the place was only broken by the chirping of this fire, and by the voice of one of the doctors, who was wandering slowly through a perfect library of evidence, and stopping to put up from time to time at little roadside inns of argument on the journey. Altogether I have never, on any occasion, made one at such a cosy, dozy, old-fashioned, time-forgotten, sleepy-headed little family party in all my life, and I felt it would be quite a soothing opiate to belong to it in any character, except perhaps as a suitor. Very well satisfied with the dreamy nature of this retreat, I informed Mr. Spendlow that I had seen quite enough for that time, and we rejoined my aunt, in company with whom I presently departed from the Commons feeling very young when I went out of Spendlow and Jorkins, on account of the clerks poking one another with our pens to point me out. We arrived at Lincoln's Inn Fields without any new adventures, except encountering an unlucky donkey at a costermonger's cart, who suggested painful associations to my aunt. We had another long talk about my plans when we were safely housed, and as I knew she was anxious to get home, and between fire, food, and pickpockets could never be considered at her ease for half an hour in London, I urged her not to be uncomfortable on my account, but to leave me to take care of myself. "'I have not been here a week to-morrow, without considering that too, my dear,' she returned. "'There is a furnished little set of chambers to be let in the Adelphi trot, which ought to suit you a marvel.' With this brief introduction, she produced from her pocket an advertisement, carefully cut out of a newspaper, setting forth that in Buckingham Street, in the Adelphi, there was to be let furnished, with a view of the river, a singularly desirable and compact set of chambers, forming a genteel residence for a young gentleman, a member of one of the inns of court, or otherwise, with immediate possession. Terms moderate, and could be taken for a month only, if required. "'Why, this is the very thing, aunt!' said I, flushed with the possible dignity of living in chambers. "'Then come,' replied my aunt, immediately resuming the bonnet she had a minute before laid aside. we we'll go and look at them.' Away we went. The advertisement directed us to apply to Mrs. Crupp on the premises, and we rung the area bell which we supposed to communicate with Mrs. Crupp. It was not until we had rung three or four times that we could prevail upon Mrs. Crupp to communicate with us, but at last she appeared, being a stout lady with a flounce of flannel petticoat below a nankeen gown. "'Let us see these chambers of yours, if you please, ma'am,' said my aunt. "'For this gentleman?' said Mrs. Crupp, feeling in her pocket for the keys. "'Yes, for my nephew,' said my aunt. "'And as sweet set they is for such,' said Mrs. Crupp. So we went upstairs. They were at the top of the house, a great point with my aunt being near the fire escape, and consisted of a little half-blind entry where you could see hardly anything, a little stone-blind pantry where you could see nothing at all, a sitting-room and a bedroom. The furniture was rather faded, but quite good enough for me, and, sure enough, the river was outside the windows. As I was delighted with the place, my aunt and Mrs. Crupp withdrew to the pantry to discuss the terms, while I remained on the sitting-room sofa, hardly daring to think it possible that I could be destined to live in such a noble residence. 
After a single combat of some duration, they returned, and I saw, to my joy, both in Mrs. Crupp's countenance and in my aunt's, that the deed was done. "'Is this the last occupant's furniture?' inquired my aunt. "'Yes, it is, ma'am,' said Mrs. Crupp. "'What's become of them? asked my aunt. Mrs. Crupp was taken with a troublesome cough, in the midst of which she articulated with much difficulty. "'He was took ill here, ma'am, and—' <coughs> <laughs> it knew me, and he died. Eh? What did he die of? asked my aunt. Well, ma'am, he died of drink, said Mrs. Crupp in confidence, and smoke. Smoke? Do you mean chimneys? said my aunt. No, ma'am, returned Mrs. Crupp. Cigars and pipes. That's not catching trot at any rate, remarked my aunt, turning to me. No, indeed, said I. In short, my aunt, seeing how enraptured I was with the premises, took them for a month, with leave to remain for twelve months when that time was out. Mrs. Crupp was to find linen and to cook. Every other necessary was already provided, and Mrs. Crupp expressly intimated that she should always yearn towards me as a son. I was to take possession the day after tomorrow, and Mrs. Crupp said, thank heaven she had now found someone she could care for. On our way back, my aunt informed me how she confidently trusted that the life I was now to lead would make me firm and self-reliant, which was all I wanted. She repeated this several times next day, in the intervals of our arranging for the transmission of my clothes and books from Mr. Wickfield's, relative to which, and to all my late holiday, I wrote a long letter to Agnes, of which my aunt took charge, as she was to leave on the succeeding day. Not to lengthen these particulars, I need only add that she made a handsome provision for all my possible wants during my month of trial, that Steerforth, to my great disappointment and to hers too, did not make his appearance before she went away, that I saw her safely seated on the Dover coach, exulting in the coming discomfiture of the vagrant donkeys, with Janet at her side, and that when the coach was gone I turned my face to the Adelphi, pondering on the old days when I used to roam about its subterranean arches and on the happy changes which had brought me to the surface. End of chapter 23